This morning, it, um, it's a really a personal pleasure to have um, Dr. Elizabeth Howell with us, who is really um, one of the nation's experts on uh, obstetrics and, and its relationship with disparities and has published some really amazing papers. Um, you know they're amazing when they hit the newspapers as well as the journals. Um, and so uh, it's really a pleasure to, to have her here. She's a professor at the Icon School of Medicine in the Department of Population Health Science and Policy, Obstetrics and Gynecology and Reproductive Science and Psychiatry as well as System Vice Chair for Research in the Department of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproductive Science. Also, she's an Associate Dean for Academic Development and is an NIH-funded OBGYN health services research in her researcher, and her research addresses quality of care, racial and ethnic disparities in maternal and child health. Her major research focuses are postpartum depression, its impact on underserved communities, and the intersection between quality of care and disparities in maternal and infant mortality and morbidity. She's served on several expert committees, including for the Institute of Medicine, the NIH, the Joint Commission, American Congress of OBGYN, International External Scientific Advisory Boards, and Editorial Boards. Dr. Howell received her undergraduate degree from Stanford, received her medical and public policy degrees at Harvard and the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. She received her residency training at Cornell and is a board-certified OBGYN. Dr. Howell received her training in clinical epidemiology as a Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholar at Yale Medical School. Please join me in welcoming her here today. So um, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. So today I'm just going to talk to you a little bit uh, about maternal mortality crisis in this country, about the racial and ethnic disparities that exist. I'm a little taller, I got it. <laughs> probably quite a bit taller. Um, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about a framework that we think about um, when we think about maternal morbidity and mortality and thinking about the complex web of factors that contribute to this disparity. We're gonna share a little bit about the research findings that we've done here in the United States and, and really most of our work is really focused more on New York City. I will talk about some of the levers now, um, about what we can do here at Mount Sinai, but also nationally what we're doing to address this issue. And then I'm gonna end with talking a little bit about the role of family physicians. And then I welcome uh, some conversation about that at the end. So as you guys all know, every day for the last, I'd say about two or three years, it feels like we've been hearing um, and looking and seeing in the newspaper a number of reports about the maternal health care crisis, how our hospitals um, are really failing women. There was a lot of attention um, looking at our international comparisons, and we actually have rates that are higher than almost all other high-income countries, and our rates actually increased over the last decade while other countries um, reduced their rates. But the big issue um, that contributes to these rising rates our racial and ethnic disparities that are long-standing and persistent in the United States. So up on the right uh, corner is Dr. Shalone Irving, and I think that hopefully many of you saw the really moving piece in ProPublica and NPR that they did um, by Nina Martin, talking about Shalone Irving, who was a CDC epidemiologist studying racial and ethnic disparities, you know, just loved by her CDC colleagues, who was 36 years old, became pregnant, um, had some complications during her pregnancy, but delivered a healthy baby girl, went home. Three weeks later, she died from complications of hypertension. She was seen four or five times in those three weeks by healthcare providers uh, and, and was reported by her mother to have blood pressures above 160 over 110, um, but nothing was done. Here is Erica Garner, who I think you guys are probably more familiar with. Her, her father, Eric Garner, was killed by the New York City police with a chokehold. She was a big advocate against police brutality. She died three months after um, childbirth from a heart attack. Recently, Nina Martin just put out another really, um, really worth it. I don't know if you guys um, saw this piece called The Extraordinary Danger of Being Pregnant and Uninsured in Texas, and talks about a number of women from not having access no insurance to having Medicaid that wasn't sufficient to all of the, the gaps in care that women are experiencing across the country, and the story of um, this woman who um, 
was actually had significant pain in her belly, did not have uh, insurance, stayed at home. Her daughter, her teenage daughter, found her in the middle of the night, screaming, writhing in pain. She came, went, went to the hospital and had three liters of blood in her belly. The other part of the story that's gaining more traction and, and attention is the experience of uh, Native American uh, women who also have elevated rates. So I was talking about this. This is data from the CDC from 2011 through 2015 showing you that black women are over three times as likely and American Indian Alaska Natives are more than twice as likely to have um, a pregnancy-related death. So when we talk about these disparities, I just want to make sure that we're on the same page, that we're, we recognize that we're not talking about just simple differences. This is a social justice issue. I believe it was Margaret Whitehead in the early 1990s in the United Kingdom who spoke about something being unfair or unjust. This is a definition by Paula Braveman uh, at UCSF that I think is helpful. Health equity and health disparities are intertwined. Health equity means social justice and health. No one is denied the possibility to be healthy for belonging to a group that has historically been economically, socially disadvantaged. Health disparities are the metric we use to measure progress toward achieving health equity. This just slide shows you the long-standing and persistent racial and ethnic disparities. And you can see that over the last you know, 80, 90 years, we've made dramatic uh, improvements uh, and, and lowering the rates of maternal mortality. Black women are in red on this slide and white are in green. And you can see that, that there was a gap even back in 1935. But as you can see in the gray line, the squiggly line, that gap has actually increased over time. And at this point is around, as you saw for black to white in 2000, the most recent data is showing us it's over three times. Many want to think that education drives these disparities, but it goes I guess class drives these disparities, but it goes beyond um, uh, um, class. This is, again, data from <clears throat> the CDC showing us the pregnancy-related death when we stratify by educational status. I think there are a couple of take-home points. Notice that black women are in green on this slide. American Indian, Alaskan Native are in pink, and white are in blue. And as you would expect, that with more education, often in almost all health outcomes, you know, it's protected. And you can see that for white women, and you can see that for um, uh, American Indian women. You don't quite see that relationship for black women. Black women with a college education are about 1.6 times as likely to experience a pregnancy-related death as compared to white women with less than a high school education. And they're more than five times 5.2 times more likely to experience a pregnancy-related death as compared to their white counterparts. Now, they didn't have enough numbers for American Indian um, Alaska Native to tell us what that, what that comparison looks like. So just to be clear that, um, you know, I've been throwing around a lot of terms, and I just wanted to quickly make sure this audience is in, on the same page, that maternal mortality is what we often hear for international comparisons. It's the death of a woman during pregnancy or within 42 days of termination of pregnancy, irrespective of the duration and site of the pregnancy, from any cause related to or aggravated by pregnancy or its management, but not from incidental or accidental causes. And then a pregnancy-related death is really up to one year. And it's a chain of events initiated by pregnancy or the aggravation of an unrelated condition by the physiologic effects of pregnancy. And maybe at the end we can talk a little bit about this because you, you <clears throat> some of you may be so pregnancy related versus pregnancy associated. But for the purposes here, I just want to make sure that you guys are understanding it's the one year thing. And that's what most, most of the work done by the CDC is looking at pregnancy related deaths up to one year postpartum. So these disparities are more pronounced in some of our cities. And New York City, this is older data, <clears throat> has very pronounced racial disparities in pregnancy-related mortality rates. Black women, um, in this report by the DOHMH, which summarized deaths from 2006 through 2010, reported that black women were 12 times more likely to die from a pregnancy-related death in New York City that the gap, the black-white gap, had actually increased from their previous report, which was 2001 through 2005 deaths. And back then, it was about six to eight uh, times, up to 12. And that the increased gap was driven by a 45% decreased mortality among whites. 
So you're seeing some improvements for one group, but you're not seeing improvements for black women. And that was really what was driving this disparity. Unlike national statistics, Asian Pacific Islanders also had elevated rates, and Latinas did too in New York City. Now, I'm part of the New York City DOHMH Steering Committee on Maternal Mortality, and we just had a meeting, and they're gonna come out with a more recent report, but the most recent data on this disparity suggests that black women in New York City are about eight times. So it's a little bit decreased from this last report, but again, really unacceptably high. This is again from um, data from that uh, report, just showing you that while black women, and you can see them in the darkest color, sort of green, blue, um, account for 22.5% of live births during this time period, they account for 57.2% of the deaths. And the leading causes of death in New York City during this time period were hemorrhage, embolism, and pregnancy-induced hypertension. And when you think about preventability, and we'll talk about that in a minute, these are three of the, the topics. These are the three causes, most preventable causes of, of, of uh, maternal mortality. And when you look um, by stratified by race, ethnicity, and again, these sample sizes are incredibly small, but it's just sort of interesting to note that, um, that you see the rates for black, Hispanic, Asian Pacific Islanders being quite high and relatively higher for hemorrhage and embolism as compared to um, white women. And again, these were the, some of the most preventable causes of a pregnancy-related death. This is more recent data from the CDC that compiled, and this one is from nine maternal mortality review boards that compiled the data. And when they go through this process, they look at contributing factors, they look at preventability, and it's a whole process. And <clears throat> they summarized uh, data from nine states. And here you can see the leading underlying causes of pregnancy-related deaths by race ethnicity. Uh, and you can see that black women are in purple and sort of the pinkish color are non-Hispanic whites. And what was sort of interesting here is that the leading, the, the, you can see that it's cardiomyopathy, embolism, and preeclampsia and eclampsia where um, black women seem to have more elevated uh, rates uh, when you're thinking about this disparity. This is just data overall showing you what it looks like overall in the country for pregnancy-related deaths and what are the causes. Again, it used to not be cardiovascular disease, and we've seen that that's really the main um, killer right now. Non-cardiovascular disease, infection, hemorrhage, cardiomyopathy, and thromboembolic disease. So a recent report from the CDC, this one summarized 13 maternal mortality review, uh, and then they also used their data that they've been collecting on deaths between 2011 and 2015, and came out with a report looking at the timing. And when I was trained, you know, we didn't we didn't really think about postpartum deaths that much. It was much smaller that, it, you know, and and this one showed us that 33% of the deaths are during 33% of the deaths are one week to one year after delivery, which was pretty striking. And so a third of the deaths, you can kind of think of it as a third during pregnancy, a third at the time of delivery, and a third um, postpartum. This just breaks it down further. And you can see um, that delivery day is 16.9%. One to six days postpartum is around 19%. And then seven to 42 days. And the reason I think this is important is, is that the report sort of goes on to tell us, well, what are the main causes of death during these periods? So as we think about strategies, we need to think about when and where these deaths are occurring. And as you can see here, I just sort of summarized the data, but it's cardiovascular and non-cardiovascular conditions during pregnancy. It's hemorrhage and amniotic fluid embolism during the day of delivery. It's hemorrhage and hypertension in that early first week postpartum. And you know there, were, there are new recommendations around the monitoring of blood pressure of preeclamptics that you really need to be aggressive in that first week and bring them back and make sure you're, you're really, um, and it's because of this kind of data. Seven to 42 days was infection, other cardiovascular conditions, and then cardiomyopathy is the big one in, the, in much later postpartum. So, a maternal death is really only the tip of the iceberg. For every death, over 100 women in this country, amounting to around 60,000 women every year, suffer a severe maternal morbidity. We're talking about a severe complication, a life-threatening diagnosis or undergoing a life-saving procedure, eclampsia, seizure, a clot, blood transfusions, those kinds of things, a woman hemorrhaging so much that she loses her uterus. 
And just like you have seen that pregnancy-related deaths have been on the rise, so have uh, a severe maternal morbidity. This is just data, again, from the CDC, just showing you the uh, trajectory. And during this period, there was an increase of about 75%. And more recent reports continue to talk about the elevating rates of severe maternal morbidity in this country. This is some data um, um, stratifying the different components of severe maternal morbidity. So this severe maternal morbidity was really um, coined a little bit by the CDC. They have an algorithm that's, that uses ICD-9 codes and now ICD-10 codes, diagnosis and procedure codes, so that you can look at this at a population-based level. And that was the idea. And it has different components. It started with 25. Now it has sort of 18 areas. But you can see here the racial and ethnic dis uh, differences for blood transfusion, DIC, heart failure, hysterectomy. And for the most part, when you go across these different um, subcomponents of the severe maternal morbidity index, black women and American Indian women have elevated rates. And what of our rates um, in New York City? So our observed rates of severe maternal morbidity here show that black women are about three times, Latina mothers about twice, to uh, two times more likely to have a severe maternal morbidity. And just like I showed you how education is not, the, um, is not protective, you can see that a black woman here with a um, college education on the far right of your screen uh, in that sort of orange, orange pinkish color is nearly three times more likely to have a severe maternal morbidity event as compared to a white woman in yellow on the far left of your screen who has less than a high school education. So again, this is not explained by socioeconomic um, status. So I've told you a lot about disparities in, in, in these sort of horrendous uh, gaps that we, we find in maternal health. So I'm a health services researcher, and we often think of things at the patient, physician, um, community, and um, system level. So we can think about race and ethnicity, but there's a growing recognition in this country that it's not about the individual's race and ethnicity. It's about our response to them and understanding what racism, structural racism, interpersonal racism, and how they play out in, in the lives of women in, in, all, in, in all of our health outcomes, but in particular here in maternal health outcomes. You can see a lot of the social determinants. I'm talking about poverty, insurance, language, knowledge, beliefs, psychosocial stress. You know, there's growing body of uh, literature sort of trying to examine more and more how stress and potentially the stress from racism and discrimination in this country, how that manifests. We, we know that there's a lot, of, uh, um, a lot of literature showing us how discrimination is associated with adverse birth outcomes, um, but we, there's far less of it in terms of maternal health. Um, community, thinking about the social network, uh, built environment, housing, clinician factors, knowledge, experience, implicit bias, communication skills, and then system factors. Access to high quality care, transportation, structural racism, and policy. So the research that we have done has really focused on um, delivery and hospital care. And I forgot to mention, so all of these things sort of contribute to the health status of a mother when she gets pregnant. And her comorbid conditions are very big indicators of her risk for having one of these severe events. So if she has hypertension or diabetes, um, those things really matter for her risk. She interacts with us, preconception, antenatal, delivery, and postpartum. And there's a growing recognition that this care continuum, uh, just as you, is, is so, so important in this, in, for this issue, if we're ever going to combat, combat maternal mortality. At any rate, most of the work that we have done has been really looking at delivery and hospital care. And part of the story, before I get into the research, is to recognize that about over 60% of uh, pregnancy-related deaths are thought to be preventable. And this is true in Europe when they have done these reviews, and, um, uh, and, and that's pretty much where it started, these enhanced reviews of maternal deaths where you're not just using vital statistics or even vital statistics linked with state discharge abstract data, but you're going beyond and collecting a lot more data, medical records. In New York, coroner, coroner's report, you know, they, they connect with a whole bunch of different systems to try to really understand what were the proximal causes, how did this, is it, and they get a group together to talk about um, the extent that it's preventable. Anyway, in this most recent report from the CDC, they found that 63% of the deaths were preventable. 
And it, clearly, that makes quality of care one of the key factors to think about in, a, in addition to all of the social determinants. So on a national level, what do we know? We know that um, some earlier work we did using nationwide inpatient sample, we showed that three quarters of all black women in the United States deliver in a specific set of hospitals, while less than, uh, while only 18% of white women uh, deliver in those hospitals. And when you look at the risk adjusted rates of severe maternal morbidity for black and white women in those hospitals, it's much higher for both. So part of the story we even see on a national level is the sort of segregated care. And we found that hospitals that disproportionately cared for black women not only had higher risk adjusted rates for both black and white women, but others in the field of obstetrics have also shown that they per perform worse than other hospitals on a number of delivery related indicators. So we got um, NIH funding to sort of focus in on this issue in New York City. Um, it's a mixed method study um, to investigate hospital quality and disparities in severe maternal morbidity, to examine risk adjusted rates and then the racial and ethnic distribution of deliveries, to conduct qualitative interviews to examine safety culture, quality improvement, and other factors, and then to conduct focus groups to explore the receipt of high quality care. So phase one, we took vital statistics and we linked it with um, state discharge abstract data. We used the CDC algorithm that I mentioned to identify severe maternal morbidity. We did logistic regression to calculate risk standardized severe maternal morbidity rates for each hospital. We use that metric and rank the hospitals. And then we assess the differences, black, white, and Latino white uh, in, in delivery location. So I think the first finding that was really quite shocking was how um, much variation, and this is very consistent with quality literature. There's a lot of variation on a number of outcomes, but we found you know, a six to seven fold variation in risk adjusted severe maternal morbidity rates uh, in New York City hospitals which has major implications for women. You can, you can be in one hospital and have six or seven times the risk than another. Um, and then we divided the hospitals in tertiles um, uh, based on their uh, ranking. And we looked at the distribution of births um, for black and Latino mothers. And we found that in the low morbidity cluster of hospitals, 23% of all black deliveries occurred in those hospitals, 65% of whites delivered in those hospitals, and 33% of Latino mothers. While the high morbidity cluster, we saw that nearly you know, twice as many black women delivered there as compared to white women, and then 29% of Latino mothers. So um, we did a, we've done a number of different simulations in the work that we've done, and I think this one, and one of the simpler ways of sort of thinking about this is what we did is we, we said, what would happen if we took, we kept everything about a black mother the same in our models, her, her age, her education, her, her BMI, her chronic illnesses. The only thing we changed was where she delivered. And let's say that we had, we, we changed that delivery distribution across the whole distribution. So if hospital A is the lowest hospital uh, morbidity, 10% of white women go there, well then let's assign 10% of black women to that hospital. Okay, if hospital B, 5% of uh, white women deliver there, then 5% of black women will do, deliver there. And we did that across the entire distribution. And then we bootstrapped it and did it like a thousand times to make sure that, our, that we, we had some confidence in our results. And we found that uh, differences in delivery hospital account for up to 48% of the black white disparity and 37% of the Latino white disparity. So obviously, you know, part of this story is, is that there, are, there is a cluster of hospitals in New York City that have worse outcomes, and black and Latino mothers are more likely to go there. Some work I'm not showing you that we um, are is going to be coming out in a, in a couple months is work that we've shown where this is between hospital differences. So now we've shown you that, that disparities are explained in a big way in New York City by between hospital differences. We also see in New York City within hospital differences. And so we've done some more recent work to sort of show that. But I want to make sure that we, you guys recognize it's both between, but there's also disparities within our own hospital. So the next steps in our work um, are to identify organizational factors, processes, and practice patterns that explain wide variation in hospital performance. And we did that using the quantitative data. And we're also uh, doing some qualitative work focus groups with moms, and then um, the last stage is dissemination efforts. 
So this sort of shows you the way we were thinking about hospital factors and quality and some of the things that we wanted to explore in our qualitative um, uh, interviews. You can think about structural characteristics, and you can get some of that from, from uh, the administrative data, but a lot of it you can't. You can't get, you don't get good numbers on staffing. You don't get, you know, have no understanding of qualifications and credentialing. Um, organizational factors such as leadership, communication, feedback and audit, promotion of evidence-based practices, and then clinical practices, and then patient outcomes. We also wanted to focus in when we did these qualitative interviews on sort of disparities, bias, communication, and sort of the role of families and, 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 and patient support. So we ranked the hospitals as you saw, and we divided them into those tertiles. And we selected four hospitals from the high morbidity cluster and four hospitals from the low morbidity cluster. Um, and we had to look at other things, which is sort of interesting. We wanted to make sure that we thought about what was driving hospitals to be high versus low, because the traditional hospital factors, such as um, uh, volume and teaching status and percent Medicaid, while they were associated with severe maternal morbidity, they didn't explain that six to seven fold variation. So we were trying to go into hospitals to try to understand what's going on here and why. And the second part of this whole um, study is really then to understand why black and Latino mothers are ending up in these specific hospitals. So when we did this, um, did, did our sampling, we also thought about other hospital characteristics because we thought it would be very interesting to find hospitals that had high percent Medicaid that were in the high cluster of uh, maternal morbidity and in low cluster. So um, we did these interviews uh, a year ago. They were semi-structured. Um, we audit taped all of them and we're in the middle of doing um, an analysis of this. We worked with a qualitative researcher who was blinded to the hospital ranking, so I was there as well. I knew the hospital ranking, but the qualitative uh, researcher did not. We have interviewed, um, you know, this gives you an idea of, of the types of people and the positions. We, we've done chairs and OB, physician director of LND, the physician or the nurse, and there's a lot of um, uh, safety folks who are uh, positioned now on labor and delivery units who their, their focus is on quality and safety. For example, here we have a safety officer, um, nurse manager of LND, frontline nurse the chief medical officer, and then in some places we also, um, there was some variation, for example, a chief quality officer. So here are some of the preliminary themes and we're working it up, and these are not really talking to you as much about the distinguishing features, but just some of the overall things that we found, that people feel that they <clears throat> provide equally good care to all patients. They all believe that staff communication is a critical factor in quality and safety, but hospitals vary dramatically in what they've done uh, to address this, and no one thinks that they have, you know, have figured this out completely. And this is actually one of the things that we have found preliminarily that sort of, you can sort of, it's one of those factors that the communication and, <clears throat> and also the flattening of the hierarchy seems to be more flattened in the cluster of hospitals that had lower rates than hospitals that had higher rates. When we asked about maternal morbidity and mortality, people don't think about the care they deliver in the hospital. They think about outside factors like social determinants. That's what everyone goes to. They don't think about sort of quality of care. And, and the reason, you know, when you think about disparities, obviously social determinants are incredibly important and that's the right angle for us to be thinking about. But when you're thinking about maternal mortality, deaths, not severe maternal morbidity, but deaths, and you're telling me that 60% of them are preventable, and a lot of that, by the way, the data shows us it's delays, it's delay in diagnosis, it's, it's communication failures on labor and delivery, it's sort of a lot of acute care issues that are happening, at least for those deaths that are in the hospital, so we have to really think about that. Um, there was wide variation in the quality measurement and uh, in, in improvement, not only in the metrics used, um, the staff that were actually assigned to quality and safety, and, and how data is distributed. So do people know their performance? Is it just leadership? Does it get to the front line? When we asked about quality data, many presumed we meant operational data on delivery services. No one analyzed data and compared performance uh, stratified by race and ethnicity or by insurance status. And we found that individual adverse events were more likely uh, to lead to quality improvement than monitoring trends over time. 
We also then did three focus groups with um, mothers who had actually experienced a severe maternal morbidity, so you know, had rushed back to the OR, maybe lost their uterus, had um, a pulmonary embolism, you know, severe events. Um, and uh, we stratified them by race and ethnicity. So we did one group among black, self-identified black women, self-identified Latina mothers, and then one for uh, white and non-black or Latina mothers. And we asked them basically two questions. We, we went a lot into how they chose their hospital and how they ended up at the hospital that they chose, excuse me, that they delivered at, and then what was their experience of care. So this is just sort of showing you, I think the most profound thing for me was listening to the mothers, a lot of them, you know, 12 to, to 18 months after their delivery, still so like, you know, traumatized from this event, many in tears. It's gonna affect their future childbearing and thinking about having another child. They felt alone, traumatic, frustrated, misinformed, and scary. Um, and that was the most striking thing for me. Um, they all, a lot of them, and this is common across all three focus groups, that they spoke about poor communication. And here's a quote about just rushing me to the OR and that it was, I just was lying there, I'm cold, I'm shaking, I know I'm not feeling good, but nobody's telling me anything. And then the third theme was not feeling heard, which we've heard a lot in the press about the experiences of women not feeling like they're, they're heard during this labor and delivery um, process. One uh, person talked about, I essentially diagnosed my own pulmonary embolism because nobody was listening to me. It's very scary to me how much I really had to advocate for myself. So what about the experiences of black and Latina mothers? And you know, these are small, these are focus groups, but just to sort of explore what might be going on is how we, 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 we started these discussions. <clears throat> a lot of the Medicaid, excuse me, a lot of the black and Latina mothers that we um, inter spoke to were on Medicaid or Medicaid managed care plans. And so they felt that they had limited access to clinicians, that they experienced um, issues with prenatal care and continuity of care. And then there were more subtle forms of discrimination that they spoke about, sort of less time spent on educating and explaining things, and sometimes feeling like they were part of an assembly line. They, you know, they'd, they'd have like five people in the delivery room have no idea who they were, and no one's really introducing themselves, and sort of feeling more like a specimen with some of the some of the some of what we heard. So um, our final phase is to you know write this stuff up and have a dissemination uh, component where we're gonna bring representatives from, we're hoping all the hospitals together, DOH city, DOH state, we have a lot of partners on this ACOG district too, uh, to come together to talk about um, our findings and how we might be able to implement you know, some change. I mean, there are things that we're finding that we probably won't be able to do much about, which are very frustrating, but clearly nurse staffing is one of the big issues, I should have mentioned that, that you can see there's a pronounced difference in nurse staffing. Um, between the clusters. So let's think about levers to reduce racial and ethnic disparities and severe maternal morbidity and mortality. And I taught you a little bit about the fact that we need to think about this entire care continuum. And while I only presented work on our, um, what we've done around delivery care, we've done a lot of work also on postpartum care and some interventions to try to link high-risk mothers back to the system, which is a really important um, component of this. But when we think about it, and this is something that you guys are all very familiar with as well, and it's part of your role, um, we can think about promoting contraception and optimizing preconception health. And, you know, we don't talk about it enough, but you know, 50%, over 50% of pregnancies are not planned, and those pregnancies are associated with higher risk, and so we need to do a more, we, this is a huge area that we need to work on if we're gonna address uh, a lot of these complications that are happening to women during delivery and, 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 and et cetera. There are a lot of new models around antenatal care, and I think you guys are doing centering. I think you guys are doing centering, right? We're starting centering here. Also, <clears throat> there's some other folks really working on the medical home model, other models for enhanced care for high-risk women. There's a tremendous amount of effort and quality and safety with um, standardization, bundles, there are these safety bundles people have been implementing on labor and delivery units to try to standardize care across the country. So for, you know, there's certain protocols for a person who comes in with high blood pressure. Once it hits 160 over 110, you need to repeat that measurement. Then you have a specific algorithm for the types of antihypertensives you're supposed to use, et cetera, et cetera. And these bundles 
um, sort of provide that guidance, and that's what's going on. Um, there are a lot of simulations that are really important for quality and safety. And then disparities dashboards. And what that means is taking the quality metrics that you monitor, stratifying them by race and ethnicity or insurance, and looking at the care that you deliver, deliver the, uh, to your populations, and then using your quality improvement tools to target those uh, gaps that you identify. And then finally, um, postpartum uh, care. And I was talking about new models of postpartum care and thinking about the role of care coordination, patient navigators, case management. And there's a lot going on in the country right now around patient navigators in this space and other things, not only to promote um, connecting women back to health, but also to connect, um, to think about breastfeeding support, et cetera. I think the part of the story that we can't forget, and I think you guys are all well aware of Serena Williams' story. She had a history of a pulmonary embolism. She goes to deliver, has a cesarean section. One day later, I think it is, or two days later, she's visiting her daughter in the, uh, uh, she's visiting her daughter in the nursery, starts to feel the symptoms and no one's listening, and you know, no one's really believing her. And then finally, she, the team comes along and she gets the appropriate workup and she does in fact have a pulmonary embolism. And it's just a story, I think, that represents, you know, she's not probably the perfect person to represent this story because she's so wealthy and does have so much more um, privilege and access. So it's a very strange story to me, and I don't think we know all the details. But again, a black woman experience of not being heard. And what I find really compelling is Nina Martin and the series of stories that they reported on around maternal deaths pregnancy-related deaths, and they did a number of um, stories over that, about two years ago, over a year period. In the one about Shalon Irving that I showed you earlier, they write, in the more than 200 stories of African-American mothers that ProPublica and NPR have collected over the past year, the feeling of being devalued and disrespected by medical providers was a constant theme. Over and over, black women told of medical providers who equated being African-American with being poor, uneducated, non-compliant, and unworthy. So if we're ever gonna do uh, this work, we need to really think of active ways to eliminate bias, to enhance communication, and to engage community. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit on the national level what folks have been doing. So there's, there's, a, there's a group called the Alliance for Innovation on Maternal Health. AAFP is part of it. It's, a, it's, a, it's an agreement, a cooperative agreement. It started with ACOG and HRSA, and now there are a number of professional organizations, A1, uh, obstetric nursing, midwives, um, some community organizations, some state DOHs. It's just a big <coughs> multi-state partnership, excuse me. And what they are trying to do is work together to implement safety bundles to address some of the most preventable causes of um, pregnancy-related deaths. As I mentioned, hypertension, venous thromboembolic disease, and hemorrhage are the three bundles that they started with, but now it's expanded. And one of the things I worked on and co-led for them was the reduction of peripartum racial and ethnic disparities bundle. Now, we didn't have a great evidence base, and this is a collection of folks from across the country. We had, we had a OBs, family docs, anesthesia, midwives. We tried to have a broad uh, multidisciplinary group to think about this, reviewed the evidence, thought about um, what we might be able to suggest to hospitals and health systems. And so this bundle is based on that. And sort of the key areas that I was just gonna sort of talk about, which we are trying to do here in a lot of different ways in OB. First of all, there's a whole, whole process. Um, we've been, you guys have seen some of the uh, broadcast news around race and ethnicity collection. This is a very long-standing effort. We've been working on this for like six years here to try to get a, you know, the training to the registrars about how you ask about race and ethnicity to patients and why you might, so that they understand why you're asking. And there's a lot of literature on how to do it and their best practices. Um, to implement a disparities dashboard, um, which I talked about, and utilize quality improvement um, to address identified gaps in care. To encourage communication, community participation in quality and safety committees, and I'd say this is the one area that we haven't really made enough movement on yet, and that's, but that is an area that we're trying to um, include more folks in. 
These maternal mortality review boards that I was talking about at the state level, everything is de-identified, but they, it, it's very encouraged that you have a broad group of people on these maternal mortality review boards, not just you know, maternal fetal medicine, OB, family doc, and, and nurses, but to also bring some other people in from different you know, patient advocates, different groups to sort of think about these deaths and, and what could have been done. And I think there's a lot of growing recognition that we need to incorporate patients and families and communities more in some of these processes for our own internal quality and uh, quality assurance. To utilize enhanced maternal mortality and severe maternal morbidity reviews even within our hospital. So one of the things our committee really talked about was when you think of a death, for example, you don't, they never, there was no focus on social determinants in the old days, right? They weren't thinking about what women had actually experienced. They weren't thinking about racism. They weren't thinking about anything else. They're trying to be very specific to clinical factors. And that's something that, that the, the committee really felt people needed to think more broadly about. Enhance communication and shared decision making. Implement implicit bias training, which you guys know the Office of Diversity and Inclusion here has like trained 21 people. And that's really been trying to be implemented here at Mount Sinai. Again, this is only one small part. There's a lot of explicit bias. There are other issues we need to address, but it's at least one step forward. And then promoting a culture of equity. So promoting a culture of equity is like, if you think about promoting a culture of safety, what we do, you know, we have anonymous reporting for, uh, you know, we've done all these things to try to promote a culture of safety. And the idea is we need to use a lot of these same tools to promote a, a culture of equity. This is from the RWJ Foundation, and you guys can find this online, but they, this group, Solving Disparities, has done a lot of work around how healthcare and hospital systems can work towards these goals. And here, you know, here are some of the steps you can do. And it's a nice resource. And you know, we don't have to go through each list of it, each thing that's listed here. But you know, it comes from the top, right? You have to have it reflected in the mission, values, and uh, vision. Uh, the other key thing is, is that, and something that we're trying to work on in the Department of OB now, is not siloing equity. You can't have thinking about it over here. It has to be part of all of, it has to be part of the work. Variation by definition is a quality problem, right? So that's, disparities by definition really is a quality issue. And so people need to be thinking about that in that framework. And there's a lot of other things such as all staff having a living wage and uh, strong working ties with community making sure that you have the appropriate uh, language standards and um, staff feeling empowered. And one of the things we recommended in our bundle was having an anonymous, having a mechanism to report disrespect and um, her, you know, racism, just like you do for medical errors, and having then also somebody who responds to that, um, that complaint. The, the other thing I'm working on, and I'm working on for the CDC, so for these maternal mortality review committees, as I was mentioning, that you, you get this, there's a standardized form called a MARIA form that all the maternal mortality review boards, and there are about 42, 43 of them now in the United States, use. So the CDC can collect standardized data on these pregnancy-related deaths. We have had terrible data on pregnancy-related deaths in the past, and so there's a real movement in this country to finally collect decent data. And through this standardized form, the CDC can then put this stuff together and then report back and give us some information. And I mentioned to you earlier, when you go through this process, there are people identify what the cause of death was, what were the contributing factors to that death, and then um, here are some um, uh, recommendations. So we're working, I'm working with a group across the country um, and some real scholars on racism and, and, and it's, it's been a very interesting process to try to help identify and define uh, racism for these maternal mortality review uh, forms and having to work with um, users, so people who are on these maternal mortality review boards, to make it actually work. So we're in New York. We're, we may have a sort of a viewpoint and an understanding that's very different from a rural community in Nebraska or et cetera. So it's been really an interesting um, process. So I think when we think about what you guys can do, and I think many of you already uh, um, are, are thinking about these things, I think it's really important to enhance care across the care continuum, to focus on preconception health, contraception and optimizing uh, women's health, um, to screen for depression, violence, and substance use. And there's an opportunity for you, unlike in, for us in obstetrics, to utilize the well-child visits to address maternal health. 
Um, I think you guys already are probably ahead of the game on thinking about screening for social determinants um, and linking women to community and medical um, resources. The thing that you might not think about because you're here in New York City, but to recognize that um, greater than half of rural hospitals with OB depend on family physicians, and there's a huge issue for rural health right now with closures of hospitals and obstetric services, um, and having to think outside of the box about how we enhance care for women who live and deliver in those communities. And then, of course, the levers that I just spoke about all address um, uh, family physicians as well. Because I don't know how many of you have seen this, but. So, Mommy, where you at? Beautiful Palm Springs. Daddy surprised me, man. <laughs> so let's a woman who has cured Hi. Dixon Johnson. We're talking about a woman who was far better than I ever deserved and made me far better than I ever thought I could be. We're talking about a woman that raced cars, who ran marathons, who had her pilot's license. Talking about a woman who spoke four languages fluently and who taught me so much, not only about myself, how to be a father, but just about love. We walked into Cedar sinai Medical Center with Kira on April 12th of 2016 with a woman that was not just in good health, she was in exceptional health. Hey, Mommy. Hey, Daddy. Hey, Hi, Daddy. She went in for the procedure. Shortly after that, we were taken to delivery. God blessed us with another substantially, amazingly healthy, beautiful baby boy. Shortly after that, Kira sitting in the bedside, and I begin to notice blood in the catheter. <clears throat> I alerted the nurses and the medical staff. They came to her attention, they examined her. They did several things. They ordered a series of tests of blood work. Around four o'clock, they ordered the CT scan that was supposed to be ordered statin. I understood that to mean immediately. I was concerned, but at that time, I understood that there was a plan and I could live with that. Four o'clock comes, five o'clock comes, still no CT scan. Six o'clock comes, they perform an ultrasound, they see that her abdomen is filling with fluid. Her blood work comes back. It shows that her blood levels are dropping. She's beginning to lose color. She's shivering uncontrollably. When they examine her, she's sensitive to the touch. So by 5.30, 6 o'clock, there were very clear signs that she was hemorrhaging internally significantly. 7 o'clock comes, still no CT scan. 8 o'clock comes. I'm begging, I'm pleading. My family is advocating for my wife. Still no scan. Nine o'clock comes, they say that they need to do a blood transfusion. And I ask and I'm begging again, do something, where's this CT scan? I thought it was supposed to be performed stat hours ago. At which point the staff at Cedar sinai Medical Center tells me that your wife isn't a priority right now. 10 o'clock comes, still no scan. 11 o'clock comes. It was not until after midnight that they finally took Kira back to the OR. As we left the recovery room and walked down that hall to the OR, and I'm holding Kira's hand and she's telling me, baby, I'm scared. And I'm doing everything in my power to just remain calm and tell her everything's gonna be okay. The doctor says to me, I'm gonna go back into the same incision I made. She'll be back in 15 minutes. And that was the last time I saw my wife alive. When they took her back into the OR, they opened her up and there were three and a half liters of blood in her abdomen. And she coded immediately. So with that, I will end, but I just wanted to re realize this is something that hits all of our families, uh, you know, women from every racial and ethnic background, but it's a particularly acute problem for black women in this country at this current day and age, and I'm thankful that there's finally some attention to this issue. Okay, I will stop there if there are any questions. Thank you. It's hard to speak after that last video. Um, 
talk more about the disparities, please, that go on within institutions. You talked a lot about between. So we live here, we hear these stories all the time. Um, what, what, are we, what can we do here and what are the disparities that we should be focused on here? So within hospitals, there are black, white, severe maternal morbidity across New York City in the hospital. Um, hospitals within, including our own, and black women on average are about, it's a, the, the disparity is not three to one, it's about 1.5 to two to one to ha experience one of these events during their delivery hospitalization. Now, from the qualitative work we've done and the work that many others, including the mass media, uh, uh, you know, efforts on this front, have explained that it's communication failure is one of the key parts of this story. And whether that's about implicit or explicit bias, whether that's about shared decision making and our failure to do so with our patients, a number of people are coming in to get care. They're not understanding what their need is. They're not understanding their risk. And that's a huge problem. Our healthcare system does much better uh, with some folks than others. And our ability to communicate effectively, I, I think, you know, it differs, and we do a better job with some women than others. So I think some of the steps that we tried to think, we thought about those factors when we did that bundle that I was talking about, and we talked about, you know, we have, there's the bundle on the website, and then we have resources that you can link to. So we have, for example, we say enhanced shared decision making. Well, how do you do that? Well, AHRQ has a tool set on that. So here, why don't you think about that? The implicit bias training is another example. Okay, let's try that and let's let's see how we can do there. So we've we've been really thinking about communication as one of the major failings here, and that we needed to um, address that. So, so one of the just follow up with that, but one of the things that we've been focusing on in our own work in disparities um, across New York City has been when and I saw that you did mention structural racism, but the fact that we don't have a single place for care for all patients, we don't have this a single method of care. Our workflows are different for patients who are private patients and people who come in through the service. So that you start out by kind of creating these different models and in a sense that that sort of sends a signal out that it's okay to, to do things differently, to communicate differently and whatever. So the structural piece I think is huge and, and starts people out by realizing that everybody should be treated the same. But when we looked across you know, um, the hospitals, you just see that there are different structures in place for taking care of people. people. So, so I'm gonna just respond to that because I think it's a very you know, important point. And, you know, but the one thing I wanna just tell you, which is so interesting in this paper that's coming out that we just did, we thought that the disparity within hospital between black and white women would be absolutely attributed to insurance status because of the different pathways that might be occurring, whether separated care, all that. And that's what we hypothesized in this paper. We definitely thought that was it. Not the truth, not, didn't happen. I'm not suggesting this, that what you said isn't true and doesn't happen, but I'm just saying in this data, in, in, in the most recent work, what was really interesting is, so if you go to a hospital that has a higher percent Medicaid, both commercially insured and Medicaid women, women insured by Medicaid, have worse outcomes at that hospital. So Medicaid matters at the hospital level structurally. But what was really interesting in our study is that within hospital differences, though, there was no difference between once you risk adjusted for Medicaid versus commercially insured. That, but the black-white difference remained, which was really an interesting finding. That being said, clearly structural racism and structures are huge. I just have to tell you this one really, really compelling story. I was at this um, maternal mortality meeting in Atlanta for the CDC just literally yesterday or the day before, I can't even remember. Um, <laughs> um, and I heard a, a woman from Mississippi who's on the maternal mortality review board get up and talk and said, you wanna hear structural racism? Let me tell you a story. 24 year old woman, pregnant, had a history of asthma. So the first thing was, She's in a more rural area and, 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 and no access to hospitals. So that her local hospital was closed. She's having an asthma attack, no hospital closed. No ambulance to take her to the next step. Her family puts her in the car to try to drive her to the next county to get her access. The police pull them over. The woman ends up dying from all these different delays. But so the structural racism there, I'm just saying there's so many different levels of it and you see, I mean, even police 
you know, taking, stopping a black, black men driving a car is, is yet one more example of how structural racism works at so many levels through many of the social determinants we think of, but also through the way that we, we deliver care. I mean, I am, you know, I, 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 I found that example really compelling. Hi, Dr. Howell. Um, as a black woman, I really appreciate the um, work that you're doing. And uh, I want to say I'm, I'm planning to start childbirth education classes in E-level, which we know is 100% Medicaid and like I think like 50% black women, black patients. Um, and I wanted to know, uh, would it be, would it change I guess the outcome if the patients there were, became better advocates for themselves uh, during labor and delivery. So I'm a strong believer that we all should be advocates for ourselves when we enter the hospital door. I find it very challenging to navigate no matter who you are and then it's even harder for, for some of us. So I think being an advocate, I also think there's a growing recognition about the importance of having another person be there with you, a support person and whether that's a, you know, a good friend, it doesn't have to be a doula, but whatever person to kind of go through the process is also helpful because you have another person's, yeah. you know, is hearing all the same material and you can sort of talk about that together. So I, I, I would say that it is a great idea to advocate for yourselves. All right, thank you. Sure. Hi, I wanted to ask more about the implicit bias work that's being done at Sinai. Is that happening? Because I do feel that our patients time and time and time again tell us that they feel disrespected multiple levels of their maternal, maternal care here by staff. And I do want to know what the efforts are to address that. So absolutely. So let me just say that the, the Faculty Diversity Council first brought um, this group called Cook Ross up here to s explain what implicit bias was. And they did a training for like the dean and the chairs or something. Um, and this was a number of years ago. And then, then finally we got buy-in so that the Office of Diversity and Inclusion could actually train people and they go for like a week or two week training down there. And now I think, as I mentioned, I think it's like 21. I'd have to talk with Dr. Butts again. I can't remember the exact number. Now we're 42,000 people. And there's a whole bunch of problems with implicit bias training. Does a one-time training matter? What do you do to reinforce it? What kind of content absolutely needs to be there? There's just, I'm just saying this is not a perfect science, but it's a beginning, right? So we can, if we can all agree that it might be a helpful beginning, then let's see what we can do. So in OB, for example, we started with, um, it's a huge issue, and we have a lot of work to do, but we started with a, um, a training, implicit bias training. So ODI did an implicit dry training for our um, leadership. Then we have done a there's a peak module that all, I don't know what the compliance is, but theoretically all the, um, all the attendings were supposed to, and I did it, go through my peak module to learn a little bit more about implicit bias training. And then we're trying to work with the Office of Diversity and Inclusion and our vice chair of um, diversity is really spearheading this, as well as our patient experience officer. Um, uh, we're trying to actually roll it out to, um, you know, through our ground rounds mechanism as well. So, those are just beginnings. I don't think that's enough. And I think we need to figure out more ways of reinforcing. You know, I give talks in OB. I give ground rounds. There, there's a, so, and I'm hoping that part of this is education and people's awareness, right, in addition. But I want to say the last thing I want to just say about implicit bias, I think what I worry about is that we don't talk about the explicit bias enough. And so, you know, we don't really have trainings on explicit bias, but I think if we started to make people accountable, if we had these mechanisms for reporting that I was talking about, or, and we did a couple of other things, we might also improve the experience for patients here. I want, I wanted to ask about, you mentioned doulas, and I was curious if there was any data on doulas decreasing either um, return or mortality or severe morbidity. So, you know, I don't know if you guys saw that Linda Villarosa's piece that was so beautifully written in the New York Times Magazine, probably about uh, maybe a year and a half ago, where she talked about the, uh, she talked about this woman who lost and had a stillborn, and it was terrible care, and she wasn't, didn't have an advocate through the process. She's talking about the intertwined disparities for, for maternal mortality and infant mortality, because this woman had preeclampsia and et cetera. And then shows how a doula came into this woman's life for the second pregnancy and how she had a much better outcome. And the thing that was misleading about that is, absolutely there's data about doulas reducing interventions, better satisfaction during labor, there's lots of good stuff. But there isn't data telling us that having a doula is going to reduce maternal mortality. 
or for that matter, severe maternal morbidity. And I'll be honest with you, when I did my qualitative interviews, I just always remember one nurse said, are you kidding me? Doulas, we need more nurses. So our ratio for on labor and delivery, like while they're delivering, like we have the right, you know what I'm saying? So, so, so it's absolutely a great thing to do, but it doesn't replace some of the basic structural things we need to, ha to provide high quality care. And when you have the governor had said, okay, we're gonna now think about a pilot program to reimburse Medicaid uh, you know, patients for doulas, which was great, right? But they didn't increase the pot of money. They're taking from existing resources and doing that. And then the second complaint about that is that the money, if you talk to folks who are doulas, and I, I, I work with a, a person in, in Brooklyn who runs a doula organization, and she's like, the amount of money that they're talking about paying us is this, this much. So there are a lot of problems with this, this notion. I think it's a good idea, but we need to do more work. Um, and it's not, the, it's not a simple solution for uh, correcting maternal, you know, improving, lowering rates of maternal mortality. Thank you so much for uh, coming and talking to us and for all the work that you're doing um, during um, women's delivery around the country and the research. I just had a question about um, the research that you did on comparing all the hospitals in New York City. Did they apply the AIM safety models at the same, uh, across all hospitals? And those were the results. So very good point. So AIM safety bundles, it's called Safe Motherhood Initiative here, right? And you probably have heard of it, but you know, there's a big effort, but they just did the three bundles here, the venous hormone embolic hypertension and hemorrhage, right? And um, that was a coordinated effort between ACOG District 2 and, and, and the folks at Columbia really were le the chart leading that. That was happening in the 2000. 14 and 15 time period. And we did ask a little bit about the SMI bundles when we went around, but we, we didn't have any document. Like it wasn't enough for us, for people have heard about it. So we weren't sure, we couldn't, we didn't get a good sense about how much they had actually implemented uh, that in the, in the cluster of hospitals that had performed uh, poorly and the cluster of hospitals that performed uh, well on risk-adjusted maternal morbidity. So we can't answer that question. However, when I was at the DOH-MH meeting that I was talking about like a week ago, what was really interesting is they were looking at the causes of death for the most recent um, pregnancy-related death reports, and they noticed that hemorrhage had decreased in New York City, which may be, right, because there was a lot of focus, I think 100 and 13 of 126 hospitals in New York State were part of this SMI effort. And the fact that hemorrhage had decreased as a cause was one promising sign of, those bund of that bundle. But I don't think anyone has really, we're trying here to implement most components of that uh, peripartum reduction um, bundle that we did for AIM. North Shore was trying as well. There are lots of things. Implementation of these things is difficult, and, um, but I haven't, I haven't heard very many other folks who are trying specifically to implement that. I'm sorry, I have a, another question. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, the, um, ha, the model of care that you were talking about, I know this is a model of care we do centering, um, of course, but I'm wondering if you are aware of any model of care, of collaborative care with uh, more high risk uh, individuals and, and, and uh, colleagues. Um, I know that there exists, something exists in rural US. I know we're in New York City, um, Mount Sinai is so close to us, but uh, it might as well be miles and miles away. Um, it's hard to get our patients into high risk um, care. Um, and I'm just wondering if you are aware of any models of collaborative care that exist where we can deliver very prompt, high quality care to our very high risk population. So I have just heard a few different kinds of examples, but I have no real detail. So, you know, women with specific risk factors being sort of smaller group settings, whether it's in a medical home, kind of thinking about it in that framework. I've heard a couple of, you know, I've heard a couple of people talking about that happening as well. And then also doing centering among a, a risk group, right? Um, taking, so stratifying it, so high risk women are, 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 and maybe getting a little bit more focused and concentrated care around that. So those are the two kinds of ideas I've heard in terms of the antenatal. And then as I talked about in terms of the postpartum, there's a lot more around care coordination right now, whether that's a navigator or a community health worker going into the home. And you know, there's, there's a whole movement also around, you know, ACOG changed its recommendations around postpartum visits. Remember the six-week thing, what does it mean? Like who, you know, where did that, 
you should have contact within the first three weeks and then actually have a visit, a comprehensive visit within 90 days. And I think there's starting to be more attention to thinking about how we might have some of those visits going to the home or having people telemedicine, you know, u utilizing some of technology to, to accomplish some of these things. Because, you know, a woman at three weeks might not be in a, the best place yet to come in, but how do, how do you think about that? And so I think there's a lot of people working on that area. Thank you. This was uh, really powerful. Um, I'm just wondering about the role that outrage plays in this process. And I'm thinking of whether public shaming and reporting this data publicly would mo motivate people more than this kind of deliberative process. We just had a clear visit from the ACGME. And it should be unacceptable to train residents with these kinds of outcomes. And so I'm just wondering, as you're sort of thinking about this nationally, and we're at the point where publishing some of this data publicly might motivate these institutions to be more proactive about whether it's, it's staffing or communication, um, you know, particularly around, you know, a lot of these are academic centers. They rely on GME dollars. They rely on their reputations. But if the quality of care is this disparate, um, how do we motivate that? Just the, the whole public, you know, the idea of almost public shaming institutions. So I believe in public reporting as well. I think the trouble has been the observed severe maternal morbidity rate would be a terrible measure to, you know, you always take the safety net hospital and then you completely, you know, you're so unfair to them, you trash them. And so my concern has always been about the risk adjustment. And we try to the best of our ability with the data that we have to risk adjust. It's not perfect. And, and I think there's been some concern about the risk adjustment. So, you know, you, you see the Joint Commission comes out with these measures to, to, to look at. And then the only thing they report now, I think, through the, the website, um, Hospital Compare reports uh, elective delivery. I don't even think they, re they report uh, uh, low risk cesarean right now. So ideally, you would have something like severe maternal morbidity or some proxy for it. I think there's some issues around the risk adjustment that make people uncomfortable right now to compare hospitals because they don't want to um, penalize uh, safety net hospitals. That being said, you know, we, I think there's a huge fail, failing right now in our field for pregnant women and quality measures and what we report and, how, and the information we provide them to make choices. It's a critical issue for me. Um, we show we, some of our older, a paper we published a few years ago showed that if you look at hospitals, if you, if you look at hospitals' uh, performance on elective delivery or low risk cesarean, they're not at all correlated with their performance on severe maternal morbidity or neonatal morbidity at term. So you have hospital measures that women, you know, women do care about cesarean sections, and I understand that, and it's overutilized, and it can lead to a lot of, we know, we know that. But what you really care about is, are you going to have a severe maternal morbidity? Or, and is your baby going to be healthy and leave and not have to have a NICU stay and not have any, right? And we, we, we don't have that measure for moms. Now we have the unexpected neonatal morbidity, this new joint commission measure for babies. But we don't have anything like this for moms to be able to sort of assess. So I think that's an important. But let's just talk about outrage really quickly. The, I'd say on a national level in some of these groups, and I don't know, it self-selects. I mean, there's a lot, this maternal mortality review uh, board meeting that I just went to taught, I mean, racism, structural racism was front and center and people were talking. Our keynote was a woman from the Century Foundation who's a scholar on sort of the legacy of, from slavery to now around uh, racism and discri discrimination and how it's impacted women's health. So I feel like at the CDC is completely acknowledging this piece and that's why they have, a, you know. So there's certain groups who are really kind of getting it. I think through the media, there's a, people are starting to understand that this is playing a role. But I, I, I think we all have to step up and start calling it what it is. And, and acknowledging it and the role it plays in, 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 the, in the care that we deliver and in the outcomes that we see. What I was concerned about a little bit with Mount Sinai in particular, and I'm sorry to put you on the spot, um, while Mount Sinai may do well as a hospital sort of internally with its um, patients of color or with a difference in insurance, I feel like Mount Sinai systematically um, tries to keep patients of color or patients with Medicaid insurance out of the hospital setting. Um, a lot of what we see with the patients that we take care of um, and their difficulty getting into Mount Sinai, I feel like a lot of that is purposeful. And I worry a little bit about shaming safety net hospitals because I think it gets Mount Sinai off the hook. Um, but I think that they are purposely making 
decisions that makes it make it hard for people to come here. Um, particularly one of the things that comes up a lot for our patients is uh, if you're 10 minutes or 15 minutes late for an appointment, they won't see you. But clearly that brings into the, you know, into part all of the transportation issues that people have. And I think that's a purposeful decision on Mount Sinai's part. How do you deal with something like that? Well, I think we, you know, I, I'm really not, a, I don't speak for the whole system at all. I'm just part of the Department of OB. And so I think, I mean, in terms of, and I don't see patients anymore, but I think this issue, for example, there has to be an acknowledgement that when a person doesn't get, you need to bring the person in and try to understand what, why they're not here and what were the barriers to them getting here. Because if we don't see those patients, they end up in the long run, that's a much higher cost. I think, I think there's a whole cost argument to be made about the way we care for people. If we're trying to keep people out of the hospital, then when they approach us and they're here, we have to take really good care of them so that they don't have a, a, you know, a complication during delivery or have a, a worse outcome. So I think, I, I, you know, I, I can only speak to what, what I know about, and I think that we have to do a better job with patients when they, you know, like in our in our E-level area, we have to do a better job with just making sure that we understand what women are going through to get here and the challenges, and so that we can be a little bit more flexible. Um, hi, thank you so much for that talk. I thought it was fantastic um, and the work that you're doing. My question is, are there is there any research that looks at differential clinical practices on a more um, granular level? So for example, a black patient is less likely to get a CT scan than a white patient or less likely to be prescribed antihypertensive medication. Um, and the reason I'm asking is because I'm thinking about that public message. And when you have that type of data, I think it's really powerful. And you can't um, sort of explain it or put the blame on all these other factors. Um, and thinking about the focus group data that you said that that there was a, everybody felt like they were doing the best work that they could, I think that could be really powerful data. So I agree with you. So what, what we know is there's a recent one around epidurals and, 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 and anesthesia. So you've heard about it in the emergency room and you heard it, but now it's in OB. So they've documented that there are differences by race and ethnicity and time. And timeliness is really the issue most of the time. So one of the things, for example, I was talking about the bundle on hypertension and the, it's the delay in treatment of hypertension. And remember, hypertension, we think of preeclampsia, but it's People, it's the strokes, it's the, that's it. You know, people think it worry about eclampsia, but it's really the strokes and those other things that then cause the death. And so um, timeliness to treatment is one of the things that we've been trying to, to, to look at. I myself have not done that because our administrative data doesn't allow us to look at timeliness. But more and more people in some of the uh, uh, collaboratives around the country that are trying to, for example, implement the hypertension bundle, are measuring time to treatment. You want to do this within less than an hour. So what were the percentage? And this is how they track themselves. So I've seen some discussion, for example, on that metric. That one, um, I think, is a really good one to look at what you're talking about. So there are these some examples of different processes of care and differences between race and ethnicity for. But a lot of this, which is much harder to measure and talk about, is this communication failure which is what comes up over and over again. What's interesting, one last thing is the preventability of these factors. So there's some earlier work from like the early 2000s that looked at black versus white preventability. So if, you know, if the overall rate is 50%, is it higher? So are more of the deaths happening to black women preventable? And back then there was about a 10, 12% gap. This most recent CDC report does not suggest any difference in preventability by race. In other words, they're all, you know, it's 60% for all of them, you know, or, or above. 